Open this up to Matthew 21, and we're going to start read right from verse 1, all the way through verse 21. And it's, the, like I said, the triumphal entry, and here, here we go. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go, for, and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Verse 10, and when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then he goes on now to verse 12, and then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all of those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and seats of those who sold doves. And then he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then verse 14, Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple saying, out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And he said to them, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have, perf you have perfected praise. Then verse 17, Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. Verse 18, Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith, and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we, are, we come here this morning, Lord, and I pray we do, Lord, open hearts and open minds, ready to hear, Lord, what you have for us this morning, Lord, for us to take in our hearts, Lord, and hear what... You want us to hear, Lord. And that's, I pray individually, Lord, for each one here this morning, and us as a body, Lord, of followers of your son Jesus, that we do have ears to hear and eyes to see on these pages, Lord, the glory that you have to show us this morning of our King, our King Jesus, our Messiah, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen, amen. 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 Praise the Lord this morning. And this is, to me, one of the great scriptures here, this triumphal entry, this is called in the Bible. And Jesus, it's really, what, what this is now, it's kind of, it's a celebratory parade. That's what it is. Can you imagine having a parade and Jesus is coming down right here on Route 9, and this celebratory parade where he's going into Jerusalem a few days before the Passover. Okay, so that's important. And to this point, up, up until this point now, Jesus has been relatively kind of quiet. He's been kind of quiet here about his mission, about his mission. And even asking people, he's even asking people, if you read the scriptures, not to even proclaim him yet. But now, now he fulfills this prophecy, which you just read, which we just read, by riding into the city on a donkey, a colt, right? And as people shout, they're shouting what we, we saw in the scriptures, Hosanna, and throw down their coats, cloaks, and what else? Palm branches. Now keep that in mind. There was two things there, cloaks and palm branches. And this kind of, it kind of shakes up the, uh, as it said in the scriptures, the scribes and the religious leaders. And they worry, because now they're worried. Now they're concerned. They see Jesus coming in this triumphal parade, and they're worried that it's going to attract the anger of the Roman Empire, the Roman who are actually over all the Jews right now. And as it turns out, interesting here as we get into this, most of these people misunderstand Jesus' mission. That's what's going to happen here as we get into the scripture. And they're, they're thinking that his plan, they're saying, they're thinking that Jesus' plan is to 
overthrow the Romans, to overthrow the Romans, to free Israel. So let's see what God has for us this morning to see maybe, let's see where God really, want, what he really wants us to know this morning. This triumphal entry. And by the way, the triumphal entry is in all the synoptic gospels. It's in John chapter 12, it's in Luke chapter 19, and it's in Mark chapter 11. So it's in all four gospels, which means, tells me it's pretty important. Amen? Amen? So this entry into the city of Jerusalem, preparation for his death. That's what's happening here. It's preparation for his death on Passover. And Jesus has been walking, and that's what they did in that day, right? They're walking up the road from where? From Jericho. If you want to look it up on the map when you go home, from Jericho. I'd love to, you should do that anyway. Just see this, this whole, how it's all proceeded. He comes from Jericho into Bethany, and then Bethpage, and he tells his disciples to find, as we saw in the scripture, find this young donkey and waiting for him that's in Bethpage. And now Jesus is going to ride on this donkey into the city, through the east gate of the city walls. That's interesting too, the east gate, because that's where Jesus is going to come back. He, when he comes back, he's going to come through the east gate. And this is actually, right now, this time, this period in Jerusalem, it's the 10th of Nisan. That's a Jewish calendar for April. Okay? So get that. This is about April, the Jewish calendar of Nisan. It's the first month of the Jewish calendar. And we're four days now in this scripture from Passover. And the Jesus is now entering the city on a Sunday. Think about today, right? Sunday. The day, with, what do we traditionally call it? Palm Sunday, right? That's traditionally what we call it. And though Jesus has come to Jerusalem for the Passover... He's, he's come to Jerusalem for the Passover, but on three prior occasions in his earthly ministry. But he's been to Jerusalem three times, is what I'm saying, prior to this. But this time is different. This time is different. And the crowds now gather outside the city. Now you can imagine... This crowd is this multitude, as the scripture says, they're gathering outside the city, seeming to sense there's something different. There's something different going on here now. There's something we see different. If Let's read just again, uh, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, and verse 9. Look, there's something different. The disciples went and did Jesus as, as instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. And he sat on the coats, and most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And then verse 9 says, The crowds going ahead of him, and those followed were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So after the disciples here, they retrieve, they go and get the donkey, because Jesus told them, hey, go get the donkey. Well, if Jesus tells you something, you do it. Right? If he's telling you to do something, do it. So he tells his disciples, go to Bethpage, get the donkey, bring it to him. And they place their, and we see the word cloaks, they place their cloaks, the disciples place their cloaks onto the donkey to do what? To make, it's like a makeshift kind of saddle. They take their clothes, they put it on the donkey, and it's a saddle. And then Jesus, what does he do? He sat on the coats, the cloaks. He sits on that makeshift saddle. And the donkey begins to take, now the donkey's now moving him into Jerusalem. Now picture that. Here's Jesus on this donkey, your king, my king, our Messiah, riding on this donkey, heading into Jerusalem. Just as the scripture, Zechariah, mark this down, Zechariah chapter 9, told us. Isn't the Bible awesome? That's in the Old Testament, Zechariah. And this prophecy says this. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, ready? Your king is coming to you. That's awesome scripture. He is just and having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's in Zechariah chapter 9. This was foretold as a prophecy, and now it's being fulfilled. As the donkey moves down this road, here's what happens. Some of the crowd, they place their, they place their coats on the, on the ground, their cloaks on the ground. Some of the crowd. Some of the crowd. Now keep that in your head. Some of the crowd. For the donkey to go over. And that may seem odd to begin with. But, for us, that seems odd. You might, would you do that? Like, here, uh, let me use this illustration. When a, when a championship team in our, in our world here wins 
People don't put cloaks down when they have a parade, right? We just cheer and all that. Here they're putting these cloaks down in front of our king and the donkey to walk over, but it was well understood to see the people of that day, they understood what was going on when that was happening. When they were laying the cloaks down, they understood exactly what was happening because within that culture in the east, right, in that eastern part of the world, it was customary to greet a king, to greet a king, the arrival of a king in that type of fashion, laying these cloaks down. And an example of that is King Jehu of the northern kingdom, at the time of the northern kingdom, this is the Old Testament, in Israel, when he was coronated, I'll read the scripture to you, just so you think, think I'm making this up here. Second Kings chapter 9, verse 13, this is King Nag Jehu, he says, Then they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet, Jehu is king. So now, let's get back to our story here. And the crowd places the coats under, the Jesus, under Jesus and into the path of the donkey. As a, Here it is, a symbolic statement that Jesus is the king. A symbolic statement that Jesus is king. And the people are hoping that Jesus, the people that got hope, they want to have hope. You have, you, hey, I think we want to have hope right now, don't we? In this world we live in. The people are hoping that Jesus' arrival in the city will lead to his coronation. That he will be the king. There are some people that are thinking that. And, at the start, and that will be the start of the kingdom. But notice something in verse 8. Look at verse 8. What does it say? Most of the crowd spread their coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. So while most of them were placing their coats on the ground in honor of the king, see, they had it. They knew what they were doing. Others chose to cut down palm branches. Now that's interesting. Why is two different things going on here? Matthew and that's why I said it's in four synoptic gospels here. Matthew, the book of Matthew says only that they were branches of trees. That's what, that's what the book says, right? But John, the gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 13, tells us they were specifically what? Palm branches. They were palm branches. John chapter 12, verse 13, I'll read it to you. Took branches of palm trees, there it is, and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's in John chapter 12, verse 13. So you have two things here again, the cloaks and the palm branches. So the palm branches, let's look at that a second. The palm branches had a distinct meaning for the Jews of that day. It did. They were, here's what the palm branches represented. They were a symbol of national liberation, meaning they were set free. That's what the palms represented to them. And the Jews, they used this symbol, the palms, to greet the Maccabees. Now, the Maccabees is not in our Bible here, but there is a, there is a, there is a book out there called Maccabees. So what happens is, the Maccabees, what they do, they defeat the Greeks, and they liberate Israel. It's in the second century, by the way. And in fact, this, listen to this, Jewish coins in that period after that, were mint, that were minted in that period, and, and even centuries after that, they had a palm branch in the symbol as a symbol of the nation, of the, as a symbol of the nation of Israel. So palm branches, listen, listen, palm branches became a Jewish symbol in the first century Jewish culture. Okay, you got that. And what, are, what, what it was a symbol of? A military conqueror liberating the nation. Now listen, a military conqueror liberating the nation. That's what the symbol of the palms were. So we have now, like I said before a few minutes ago, you have two groups. You have two groups here with different perspectives. With different perspectives greeting Jesus as he arrives into Jerusalem. Now some in this crowd they greeted Jesus with the coats on the ground, while others greeted him with the palm branches. And the first group saw Jesus as their Messiah. Ah, the first group, the ones that were laying the coats down, they see Jesus as the Messiah. They see Jesus as the Messiah sent to defeat Satan, Satan's kingdom, and establish the kingdom of God on earth. That's the first group. But the second group... 
saw a Moses-like conqueror coming to defeat Rome. So you got two distinct groups here to liberate Israel and establish a new Davidic dynasty. You got two separate groups here. So, like I said in the beginning, we call this day Palm Sunday. That's our tradition, right? To remember the ones who were laying down the palm branches in front of Jesus. But the one group in Jesus' day who had the palm branches, what they were doing was make, they were making a political statement. They were making a political statement, not a religious statement. That's interesting. If you've ever read this before, there's two distinct things going on here. They were celebrating, the ones that were laying the palms down, they were celebrating a military leader bringing a political victory. Hmm. Not a Messiah. Not a Messiah preparing to rule over God's kingdom. That's not how we should remember in that, in that moment for us. Maybe, you know, I don't, uh, listen, listen, I think it this way. Maybe a better way to remember Messiah's, our Messiah's entry into Jerusalem would be better called Cloak Sunday or Close Sunday. I know, now we're not going to change it. We're not going to change it. But that's what I kind of see. I want to be the ones that are laying the cloaks down saying, come on, Messiah. I don't care about the political. Do you? Hey, I know we're all getting caught up. Hey, be careful now. As we go ahead into this this season of election and all these different things and you know right now I see a lot of different things happening where they're trying to separate you know, separate us and kind of making us uh, uh, weaker as Christians they're using this term these Christians are nationalists they're trying to make us they're trying to make us out to be uh, uh, these crazy Christians and we they got we got to watch out for them you know, but no, 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 we, you know what, we're going to do our duty, we're going to do our civic duty, we're going to vote, and we're going to vote our, our biblical worldview, and we're going to vote, and that's because what we're called to do, to be good citizens, because that's what Jesus told us to do, but we know who our king is, but we know who our king is. So because they laid down their coats, who rec they recognized Jesus as the Messiah, we now see in Matthew the crowd greeting Jesus with coats and palm branches, and the crowd is also, here's what the crowd is also doing. Here's what they're doing. They're singing. They're singing. Now this crowd is singing, and where are they singing from? They're singing from Psalm 118. In your Bible, if you want to read it and go sing it at home later with your family. <laughs> psalm 118, they're singing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Taken from that psalm. Actually, what that is, that's a messianic greeting from, that rib the, from the rabbis. They taught Israel to proclaim when the Messiah comes. Oh, that's really important. The rabbis taught when the Messiah comes, we will sing this to him. Psalm 118. And everyone was singing it. Everyone was singing it. Which kind of indicates to me that the crowd was there to greet Jesus the Messiah. That's, I would think that initially, but now we see, we see these two distinct groups. But remember in that crowd, there were two different groups, right? And that what the Messiah was coming to do for Israel. And as usual, hey, look, and we have these two groups, and who's kind of trailing behind this, behind these two groups, as usual, who are they? The Pharisees. The Pharisees are right behind them, and they're, and they're either, they hear, they, the Pharisees, they hear the crowd singing, and it's getting them uptight. Oh, it's getting them uptight, these Pharisees, right? Because Luke, Luke tells us they object, right? In Luke chapter 19, verse 39, if you want to write that down, Luke chapter 19, verse 39, here's what it says, ready? Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples, teacher meeting Jesus. Rebuke your disciples. And then Luke chapter 19, verse 40 says, But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. See, the Pharisees, they recognized the meaning. They recognized, they knew, they knew what the crowd was singing. Oh, they knew. They weren't ignorant. They knew they were singing that Psalm 118. And of course, what did they do? They want to silence the crowd. They want to silence the crowd. Don't let nobody silence your, your belief and your faith and who you are in Christ. Amen. Don't let anybody do that. So they moved to silence the crowd and they asked Jesus, hey, you re Jesus, you rebuke your people. Rebuke these people. Which, which tells me they were expecting Jesus to, to renounce and they were expecting Jesus to say, okay, I'm not the Messiah. They were, that's what they expected. 
when he said rebuke them. And of course, what does Jesus do? Jesus does the opposite. Sure he does. Jesus does the opposite. He tells the, he tells the Pharisees that if this crowd didn't proclaim Psalm 118, the rocks would have done it. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? Jesus, here's what Jesus is doing. He's basically confirming a powerful biblical truth right here. And I'll tell you where it is. It's in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. Here's where it's summarized. Jesus is telling us a biblical truth here. He's telling those Pharisees something right out of Isaiah. He says, so will my word... Now this is the Old Testament again. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter which I sent it. So then here, so that's in Isaiah chapter 55, 11, the true, a biblical truth there that Psalm 118 now declares that this, as the Messiah arrives, as Jesus, like, think about this now, Jesus coming on a donkey headed to Jerusalem, as the Messiah, as he arrives, it says this in Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And that would be sung in recognition of his arrival. And since the word now has gone forth, right, it's gone out there, it would be accomplished, and guess what? Nothing's going to stop it. Nothing's going to stop the plan of Jesus as he goes forth in this Passion Week, in this week where he comes to meet his death and his, res his burial, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Nothing's going to stop it. Nothing's going to stop it. Not even the Pharisees. And that's today too. The ones who, the ones who rebuke Jesus or conflict with, don't want to listen to our, our story as Christians, nothing's going to stop it. Nothing's going to stop us, Christian, in who we are in Christ. Amen. Believe that in your heart. Even when things come up against you and people throw all these different things about you, nothing's going to stop it. Amen. In fact, Jesus says that even if the Pharisees had somehow managed, if they managed to even silence the crowd, what does Jesus say? Then the rocks themselves would cry out. Think about that. The rocks would cry out. Amen. And on that day, and on that day, some in the crowd were willing to participate in obeying Psalm 118, which is a beautiful thing when you think about it. But there were others like the Pharisees that were not willing. And that's like I said, the same thing today. So in chapter 12 of Matthew, actually, when Jesus declared the nation of Israel had committed, what does he do in chapter 12? He says that Israel has committed the unpardonable sin. And when in Israel, which they did, they rejected Jesus' claim to be Messiah, Jesus declared this, that they would not see the kingdom set up in that day. He said, that's it. You, you do not, if you don't see me as Messiah, then you will not see the kingdom in that day. And in Luke chapter 13, Jesus gave, here's what Jesus does in, in, uh, in Luke chapter 13. He gives Israel an ultimatum. He gives them an ultimatum. He says this, and this is, this is a great scripture for even think about today, the modern day Israel, where they're at. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and the stones that sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. Then Luke chapter 13, 35 says, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he. Listen, I'll repeat that. Listen. I will say to you, this is Jesus speaking, I will say to you, you will not see me, he's speaking to Israel, until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118, even to this day now. See, Jesus is telling Israel that since they would not receive him as Messiah, even in that day, that the kingdom would be, the kingdom would be withheld from them. And Israel's house, here's what Israel's house meaning, the temple, the ruling dynasty of that day, and their nation. Their nation would become desolate for a time, which it has, it still is, believe it or not. There is, time is still, Israel's still in a desolate stage, as far as what Jesus sees, as he preaches here. And Jesus would not return, now listen, Jesus will not return for Israel until they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There it is. That's when Jesus will come back. 
There's a phrase, that's that phrase again from 118, the messianic greeting, that Jesus would mark, mark his return and the arrival of the kingdom. And now we see the crowd doing exactly what Psalm 118 requires. So here we are now seeing Psalm, the Psalm, this Psalm is being fulfilled as Jesus, I, I'll ask you this. So here's Jesus in his triumphal entry. Are we seeing... In this triumphal entry, are we seeing Psalm, this Psalm being fulfilled right now on this triumphal entry as Jesus rides into Jerusalem? Is this the moment, this triumphal entry, where he brings them into the kingdom? No, it's not. That's important. And with the Pharisees continuing to dispute with Jesus over his identity, it proves that it isn't the moment because they're still fighting it. <laughs> they're stubborn, they're stiff necked. And we see Matthew inserts, he inserts a statement here in chapter 21 to make clear that not everyone was on board. Not everybody was on board with this messianic declaration. Kind of similar today. In Israel, they're, they're not on board yet. They really aren't. They're not on board yet with this messianic declaration. Matthew 21.10 says, when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred. And what did they say? Who is this? Who is this? Matthew 21, 11 says, and the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus, Nazareth, Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So even, even this, here's Jesus in his three-year ministry, now leading up into this Passion Week to, like again, his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. He has this three-year ministry of miracles and teaching, and there are still many in Jerusalem who didn't even know him. They didn't even know him. And even among those... Listen, even among those who did know of Jesus' ministry, the only identity they gave to Jesus, that he was the prophet from Nazareth and not the Messiah. Really? Math, here's Matthew's point. Here's his point. Is that, that there was anything but a consensus, meaning everybody was agreeing about Jesus' identity. So even we see this crowd, they embrace Jesus as he arrives. They were certainly in the minority. The ones that truly believed were in the minority. Maybe we're, we're in the minority, aren't we? In some aspects of this, walk on earth right now. Sometimes I feel that way. I mean, that, I'm, that's not a bad thing, by the way. But that just puts, that just tells us we have, we better, we better be ready to tell people the good news when we get that opportunity. They were in the minority, and that's why this is not that's why this triumphal entry is not the moment that the kingdom arrives for Israel. That is to come. That is still to come. Because when Jesus made that statement in Luke chapter 13, he was really kind of doing this. He was stipulating a requirement. A requirement. We, I think we just, we just talked about that for his return to Israel and receiving the kingdom. And the statement was that all, here's the statement, I'll make it simple for us. Here's the statement so you can understand this. That all Israel must accept him before he returns. That's, that's a pretty simple statement. All Israel must accept him before he returns. See, we're good. The church, we're good. You, you guys, you believe, you're, you, Jesus is your savior, then you believe in Jesus that... He came and he died and he was, resurre he was resurrected for your sins. You're good. We're gone. We'll go, we're going to be going to be with him when he comes and takes the church out. But Israel will still be here. Because all Israel has to accept him before he returns. See, in it, look, an individual Jew right now walking on the planet who accepts Jesus as Messiah, that individual is saved. He's saved by their faith, just as we are. That's, that's, I would agree with that. But that doesn't bring about the Jesus' second coming. You've got to understand this here now. That it doesn't result in the kingdom arriving as the nation of Israel. See, all Israel, when I say all Israel, I'm talking about, there's going to be, I'm talking about the nation. All Israel, the nation, must receive Jesus as Messiah. And that's going to happen. That will happen. And when that happens, Jesus is going to come to them. And at that time... You know what? And at that time when that happens, what are they going to be singing? They're going to be singing Psalm 118, just like in the triumphal entry. Aren't they? But at that moment, only some are singing it. 
right now as we go through these, as, as these scriptures we went through this morning, while others like the Pharisees are trying to stop it. It was the Pharisees' rejection of, of, of Jesus that caused Israel to lose the kingdom. The Pharisees. Their rejection caused Israel to lose the kingdom in that day. In that day. And see, see, you continuing here. But the good news is this for Israel, a future generation of Israel will declare Jesus to be the Messiah. That's coming. That's coming. Amen. Without objection. Now without objection. And he'll return to them in that day. And I believe we'll see that day. Well, I mean, we'll be with Jesus, so we'll be able to see when that happens, right? And if you're wondering, maybe you're thinking, I hope maybe you're thinking that how all Israel comes to proclaim Jesus as their Messiah, you're going to find, you know we're going to find that answer? In Zechariah. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. As G, because look now as we go forward in this, and again, if you want to read that, Zechariah chapter 12, Jesus this says exactly how it's going to happen. And as now as Jesus, he enters the city, right? Now, now fast forward here. He enters the city. He's going, where does Jesus go? He goes to the temple. All right? He comes into his triumphal entry. Now he goes to the temple. Why? Because Jesus is now fulfilling the requirements of Passover. Ah, oh, the sacrificial lamb, the paschal lamb, which is required. The paschal lamb, the Passover lamb is required. Jesus is now going to the temple. Why is he going to the temple? To be, uh, why? Because in the scriptures it tells us it has to be kept for four days. The paschal lamb has to be kept for four days. And during the, those days, what happens, the lamb... This is now, this is the lamb. Jesus is a lamb, but we're talking about if Jesus, in this Passover, they literally had to bring a lamb to be sacrificed. So this, during these days, the lamb is inspected to ensure it was spotless and without defect. So as the Passover lamb, Jesus, Jesus too must be inspected in the temple for four days. In his house, the temple. In his house, so Sunday, this triumphal entry, this Sunday, is the first of those four days. And on that day, the Lord makes a statement about the purpose of his house. This is important, Christian. Listen what he says about his house. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. And Jesus, and this, this is his house here right now, by the way. I hope you believe that. Jesus chapter 21, verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And Matthew 21, 13 says, And he said to them, It shall be written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. See, Passover was one of three feasts. You've got to understand this now. Passover is one of three feasts on the Jewish calendar. And when the adult, Jew, and the adult Jewish males, they made what they had to do, they had to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And you know what? As many as many as possibly up to three million males came into, accompanied by their families, they would descend upon Jerusalem, think about this, during this week, this Passover week. About three million. And as Jesus enters, he enters now the temple grounds, right? Picture the scripture we just read. He encounters, I think he says, it's a sad thing for him. He comes to the temple and he's looking around. He's going, what is going on here? As the scripture says, you're making my father's house into a den of robbers and thieves. I think he would be upset, wouldn't he? The court of the Gentiles now is surrounding the temple, the building itself. It's being transformed now here. Think about this picture. Here's that Passover and it's kind of turned into like a flea market. A merchant's flea market. Think about flea markets you go to and people are selling things left and right. How much you want for this? How much you want for that? That's what was going on around the temple. And the money was being changed because that's what they had to do. They had to change money. And it, kind of the same way you know, back in the day, and I haven't done this in a while, if you go to a, a foreign country at the airport, you change, exchange your money for the currency of the cu country you go to. It's kind of similar here because here's why. That the Jews that would see the Jews now, they're living under Roman occupation. 
And the temple, the temple was a, was a bit like visiting home as kind of a foreign country because it's over the Romans, right? It's even the temple's over the Romans. The Romans are under it. They're under Roman rule. The only coins there, and this is why they had to change it, because only the coins that could be used to buy and sell in Judea were Roman coins. So that's why people, they had to carry around Roman coins to have exchanged to whatever they wanted to buy. But... In the temple, the authorities considered Roman coins to be idols. And since they had that moment or the imprint of Caesar's image on it, they, they couldn't use that money. So the, the temple authorities, what they did, they said, ah, no, no, now think about this. These are part of the Pharisees too. They're saying, you can't use that Roman coin. You can't use that Roman money in the temple. Citizen, pilgrim, Jews who came to the temple had to exchange their coins. They had kind of like what I just said. When we go, we, we go to a foreign country, we had to change our money in the outer court of the temple. So what happens? These con men, for lack of better terms, or they might we think they're businessmen, they, they're set up, they set up booths to exchange Roman coins for a fee. For a fee. Now I'm getting to a point here where Jesus is so upset. These worshipers, they come to enter the court to exchange their drachmas for shekels. Okay? And then they make an offering to the temple in shekels. They're good to go there. And of course, the temple authorities, the ones that were running the temples, what did they do in that exchange? They took a cut. They took a cut of that money. These are religious people, by the way, taking their cut from the profits of the businessmen. It sounds pretty interesting. It still goes on today, doesn't it? <laughs> as, as, why? So they can, that was the kind of like a, here's your payment so we can operate. Thank you. Thank you, Pharisees. We can make some money too. So, and, the, and you know, take, get, and again, always think about this, why Jesus is so upset in these scriptures. These worshipers, because that's what they were, these worshipers, think about all of us, we're going to Jerusalem and we're going to worship, right, going to the temple. They traveled, they traveled for many, many miles. And they, and, and they had how they traveled. They traveled by foot. They didn't have bus or train or plane. They were going by foot and they're going by many miles to meet the obligations, because they were religious, they meet the obligations of the feasts and the temple service. And another source of profit, now here they have this profit, and here's another source of profit for the priests. After changing the money for a price, the family had to go and get a lamb. Now the family had to go, and buy, to, go to another booth and buy a lamb, which a lot of people couldn't afford. But the priests, they were, they were profiting, the priests were profiting on both ends. The entire temple operation in Passover had become a scam. It was a scam operation to make money off of. So Jesus, here we go, he comes into the grounds of the temple and he's experienced, what is Jesus, look, what is Jesus experiencing right here? Anger. Je your Jesus, our Jesus is experiencing anger. But it's not the anger, it's a righteous anger. It's good to have righteous anger. I'm not saying go up somebody, I have righteous anger, I'll punch him. <laughs> Don't say that. Use scripture. You want righteous anger? Use scripture. But he has righteous anger. You're Jesus, our Jesus. And he's experienced this righteous anger for those worshipers. Just like when you get, when someone kind of like pushes you away, or you get in a situation and you feel like, ah, oh, I'm being pushed away. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is with you. He's with you. He's experiencing this righteous anger for these worshipers who come, they come with an honest heart, with honest intention. And Jesus, what does he do? He turns over the tables. He turns over the tables. And what does he do? He quotes from Isaiah 56. Again, the Old Testament. There it is. He quotes from Isaiah 56. And where the Lord, where actually the Lord promises that Israel will have a special place in the millennial kingdom, meaning further down the road, and like I said, we'll be out of here. Here's what, I'll read it to you. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 5 and 7. And verse, yeah, 5 and 7. Listen. Isaiah 56, verse 5. He says, To them I will give my house, and within my walls a memorial, and a name better than that of the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, which will not be cut off. That's Israel. He's talking about Israel. And then verse, verse 56, chapter 56, verse 7, he says, Even those I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Ah, there it is. My house, what? 
of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable to my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. That's in Isaiah chapter 55. So here, again, as we come to the close here, the environment that Jesus is experiencing here, that he, I would say he encounters here in the temple in Jerusalem on that day, was exactly the opposite of what God intended, which is sad in a way, for Jerusalem. These merchants and these priests were taking advantage of their own people. And that makes Jesus angry. And in fact, I'll tell you this, we should remember that those, and I hate to say this, but there are those who continue to fleece the flock today. Yeah. It is true. It is true. And it still makes the Lord angry. I believe that. I believe that. You see some of the... Hey, look, I'm not going to name the names. I could name them. I would name them. But there are plenty of... There's, a, there's plenty of fleecing going on with the flock. And the Lord does get angry, like I said. And one day, though... But here, take this in your heart. Because when you see him and you get... I, me, I get personally... I get, I get, I get wound up. And I just want to go and shake them. But look... One day, God's wrath, the wrath is going to come down on those who take advantage of believers. It's going to happen. It will. And I'm going to read the scripture to you before we end this. So you think that you know in your heart when you come up against these people sometimes and you see them and you go, how could these people be? And oh my goodness, it's so terrible. But here in 2 Peter, he says this, but false prophets also arose among the people. Same today. Just as there were, will be also false teachers among you who will secretly in introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master, and I see that too, who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And then he goes on to say, Peter, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. Meaning, don't take, the people will use their own, these, prop, these, these false teachers, they're just going to use their own, the way they think, their own sensualities, as he says, and then he goes on to say, and their greed. Did you hear that word? In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Then he goes on to say in verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and never cease from sin, enticing. And listen, this is what gets me, because there's a lot of people out there that are getting sucked into these type of things. It says here, here's exactly what the scripture says, having eyes full of adultery never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. You see that? There's people out there, you say, how could they listen to them? They're unstable. They don't know the truth. They don't know the word of God. They don't, they're not in there meditating every day and knowing the truth. Because that's going to, you can listen to any man. But sometimes man, like here, is telling us that man will tell you lies. The word of God will not. The word of God is true. It says enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. Then he finishes up here, he says, Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Just be assured this, brothers and sisters, as we, come to, we do come to the end here. The Lord not fooled. God is not fooled. In all of this, he's going to handle it. He's going to handle it his way. And on that day, when we come and we see in Jerusalem, what does he do? You just think now back, what we were just talking about, what does Jesus do? He turns over the table, and on that day, he, what does he do? He shuts down the business for that moment. And that's going to happen. And now I'll tell you this. Follow that example, brothers and sisters. Follow that example. I'm not saying going around turning all the tables and knock on people's doors and rush them. But follow the example of Jesus here. You see unrighteousness. You see things that, are, that get your heart and crush you out. Follow. Look. Here's how you follow it. Don't allow yourself, don't allow yourself in your pursuit of God, in your pursuit of Jesus, to become the pursuit of earthly things. Right? The pursuit of earthly things. Don't let that be your first priority, the pursuit of earthly things. Man, I saw a lot of earthly things this past week. It's beautiful stuff. <laughs> beautiful homes, beautiful boats, beautiful properties. God bless. But that shouldn't be our pursuit. If God blesses us, that's wonderful. Don't 
allow yourself to the pursuit of God to be pursuit of earthly things. Because you know what? And just even think about our church. We don't, you know, we don't pass, we don't pass a, a, a hat around or say, give us money, give us money. We don't do that, right? Because I want, I want our church to have pure motive, to be pure in our giving. We have, we have to have purity in the, have a heart for it. Not to, oh, you got to give. We got to have a thermometer. We got to hit this number. We got to hit that number. No. That's not what we're talking about here, even in this church. We, I, I don't want our church to ever be mistaken for one of those ministries where, that are trying to fleece the flock of God. Amen? So this time, the, the Lord wants our house, this house, your house, to be a house of prayer. That's what the scripture told us this morning. And you can't serve God and mam the word mammon or wealth at the same time. And that's what we saw. So pick one. Who are you serving this morning? Are you serving God or are you serving mammon? And if you don't know which one you want to serve, come see me after church. I'll talk to you about it. Let's all stand. Come on, let's praise the Lord now. Now, if you don't know, if you don't know who I was talking about, maybe someone, someone sitting here right now, if you don't know who I was talking about this morning, his name is Jesus. Amen. He's the King of Kings, the Messiah. And if you don't have a relationship with him, just like Israel didn't have a relationship with him, you're going, to have, you're going to be at the end of the line. You're going to be waiting. And you might be waiting for something not good, and you probably will. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, look, there's only one way, one truth, one life, and a lot of people have trouble with that. But you show me in scriptures and any other scripture in the world where it, does, where it says opposite of that. How to be saved. To become, become saved in, in the Lord Jesus. In his death, burial, resurrection, which we're going to celebrate this week. And we go through the Passion Week, and I suggest you do this. Go open your Bible, find the Passion Week, see each day what Jesus went through from Monday all the way up until the Passover to Thursday. And then, of course, Good Friday. But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I ask you this. Come to a relationship with Jesus right now. Maybe you have a shaky relationship with you. Maybe you're not sure. Come to him. Just open your heart and say, Lord, I believe in who you are. I believe what you did. That you died for my, that you died for my sins. That you were crucified. For me, you were put up on that tree. And then you were resurrected. And you, you conquered death. For me. If you could just say that in your heart. And repent. And repent from your sin. Because we're all sinners. We know that. But we want, you know what? If, look, we'll be sinning until we leave here. None of us are perfect. But if that repentance you turn away, God will come into your heart, and I pray you would sin less. And if that's you this morning, just cry out to him and say, I believe. Just like it said in the scripture. Paul said, I believe. That's it. And he'll come into your heart. And you go forward, and I will tell you this. It's a journey you don't want to miss as we head home one day. Right? Amen.